you can fly. It's who we are and it's why we're here. Welcome to the 2020 U.S. Air Force AOPA High School Aviation STEM Symposium. I'm Elizabeth Tennyson, the Executive Director of AOPA's You Can Fly program, where our mission is to get people flying and keep them flying. Here at the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, we know there are incredible learning and career opportunities just waiting for your students. And our team works hard every day to give you the tools you need to open those doors. Most of you joining us today are educators. And I'm pretty sure this year hasn't turned out quite the way you expected. As it happens, we're all in the same boat. We were expecting to be with you in person, but instead we're meeting virtually. We'd planned to do this in Orlando, surrounded by palm trees, and flamingos, but that was the best we could do. All joking aside, we have a really wonderful program for you and we are excited that you're going to be spending some time with us. Before I tell you all about what's coming up, let me take a moment to thank the sponsors who've made this symposium possible. The U.S. Air Force is our title sponsor this year and we're going to hear more about some incredible flight training opportunities they have available to high school students. California Aeronautical University is our panel sponsor today, bringing us some great conversations. And we're also sponsored by ASA and Redbird Flight Simulations. Our thanks to all of them for helping to bring us together. So, what have we got in store for you? We'll hear from industry insiders, including AOPA's own President and CEO, Mark Baker, as well as Captain Mark Champion, who's the Managing Director of Flight Training for United Airlines. We're going to talk to them about what the future holds for aviation. We'll also be talking to leaders who are shaping the future through urban air mobility, innovative engineering, and more. You won't want to miss hearing about how you can promote diversity and inclusion in your aviation programs. We'll be talking to leaders from Women in Aviation, the Organization of Black Aerospace Professionals, and UPS. We'll give you practical tips for getting your students out to the airport and flying or even building airplanes from experts who've made it happen, including retired astronaut Story Musgrave, who owns and flies an airplane built entirely by high school students. You'll also learn how both you and your students can get up to $10,000 for flight training as part of the more than $1 million in scholarships available to students and teachers through AOPA each year. And, of course, we'll tell you all about the AOPA High School Aviation STEM curriculum, including offering you a sneak peek at the 12th grade courses now in field testing. We'll tell you how you can use the curriculum for free, whether you want to teach just one course or all four years. Before we dig into all that, I just want you to know that in order to bring you so many amazing guests in such a short time, we're going to have a mix of live and pre-recorded segments. Throughout the event, you'll have the chance to share comments, ask questions. You can do that in the chat window. AOPA staff will be responding to your questions and comments live in chat, and we'll also answer some of them on the air. We're also going to have some Air Force personnel joining us, and they can answer your questions about the opportunities they have for your students. So be sure to sign in and join the conversation. But now, to guide us through the event, I am very pleased to introduce you to our host, Many of you may be familiar with his work helping young people learn about aviation careers and helping them become better, safer pilots. I guarantee that many of your students follow him on YouTube and across social media. He's a professional pilot, an aviation educator, an entrepreneur, and an internet sensation. There is a lot more to say about our host tonight, but I'm gonna let him speak for himself. Most of us spend upwards of $100,000 to become professional pilots, and yet when you show up on day one of your first job, you still might not know what to expect. That's what I'm working to change, and it's my way of helping solve a small part of a worldwide pilot shortage. This job allows you to travel the world, work with some of the most passionate people out there, and fly some seriously cool aircraft. But being a professional pilot is tough work too. You'll never truly have a normal schedule. You will spend plenty of days on the road, missing holidays and having early mornings, and it's normal to feel lonely at times. Even just decoding the process behind becoming a professional pilot is tough. That said, I love this career and I love aviation and I want to show you why.
This job is so much more than flying incredible aircraft. We face mechanical difficulties, challenging weather situations, and busy airspace to get our passengers safely to their destination. We're entrusted with the lives of tens of thousands of passengers over each one of our careers, and that's a responsibility that none of us take lightly. It takes years to get here. I started flight training when I was 15 years old at a local flight school, and later went to the University of North Dakota for my degree and professional flight training. And to build my flight experience, I flew for Mokalele Airlines in Hawaii and had the time of my life. Today I'm an airline pilot and it's become my mission to help make your path towards this career just a little bit easier. Whether that's preparing you for each step of training, highlighting the daily operational side of working at an airline, or showing other career paths, I hope that there's something that you can learn from each one of the videos that I create. Please welcome Swain Martin. Swain, thanks for being with us. I know you made that video quite a while ago, and the current pandemic has really changed some things about the way you work. But one thing I know hasn't changed is your passion for helping young people discover and understand aviation careers. Tell us why that's so important to you. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. I'm really glad to be here. You know, when I realized I wanted to be a professional pilot, I didn't really know what I was getting into or even how to get started. I want to take the guesswork out of it for people who are getting into an aviation career, and I want to make sure that they know what's involved and that they'll find a career that they love, whether that's being a pilot, an engineer, a technician, or one of the many other aviation aerospace professions out there. My own interest in aviation took off when I was in high school, and it's the perfect age to begin chasing that dream. So I'm especially excited to talk to so many high schoolers and teachers and administrators today. We've got so much to talk about, so let's get started. AOPA President and CEO Mark Baker stopped by our studio a little earlier because he wanted to make sure to extend his own heartfelt welcome to this very special audience and to address some of the big issues on people's minds like what are the prospects for young people considering an airline career? To help him answer that question, he is joined by a leader from United Airlines. Let's listen in. I want to welcome everyone to the sixth annual You Can Fly High School Symposium. Well, have we grown. I'm excited about this event and to interact with educators across the country. Even though we're doing things a bit differently this year, what hasn't changed is our passionate dedication to ensuring a bright future for aviation. And to the thousands of young people who have shown an interest in pursuing an aviation career. A big thank you to the United States Air Force for helping out put on this important event. We share a focus on getting more people in the skies. One of the most important missions at AOPI, and one I hold dearly, is to enrich the health of the aviation industry. And the only way we can do this is to increase the opportunity. It's so exciting to see our program expand to one that serves thousands of high school students across America. And now, as you'll soon hear, according all high school grades, I'm especially heartened to hear that our curriculum is attracting broad range of students across the country. We need more women and those of underserved communities if we have an aviation future that is healthy. We've heard such wonderful things from educators around the country on how our high school STEM program and the curriculum is fueling young minds who are embracing aviation in their studies. We have an exciting agenda for you today and I hope that you are inspired and ready to embark on a lively discussion. Along, from here, along with hearing from us, this is an event to share best practices with each other. We want to hear and learn from you. So now, I'm pleased to kick off the symposium and the sessions welcome today, Captain Mark Champion of United Airlines. United Airlines has been one of the longest and most consistent supporters of the You Can Fly high school program. And in fact, many of you probably attended last year's symposium hosted by United at their world-class flight training center. It was our best event yet. Mark Champion is a managing director of the flight training for United. He is responsible for leading a team of over 500 professionals who train United airline pilots at their flight training center in Denver, Colorado. He began his flying career as a flight instructor and flew as a charter pilot, commuter pilot, and a corporate pilot before he joined United in 1985. Welcome, Mark. 
Well, these are truly unprecedented times, and in the airline industry, it survived difficult downturns before. I have a lot of friends and relatives that have survived past shocks, and you've been around the aviation business for a great long time. So I think there are still bright spots out there that uh, may be a little bit further on the horizon, but what are the bright spots that you see as, as leading the United in that role? Well, that's a very good question. I, I'll tell you, we see uh, a lot of bright spots on the horizon. We, we are in the business here at United Airlines of connecting people and uniting the world. And that is, in fact, our shared purpose for all 80,000 of our colleagues. And uh, as we look out at the future, we feel like the circumstances we now find ourselves in as an industry is really an anomaly and it's temporary. And people still need to make that personal connection. We know that uh, we will continue to connect people around the globe uh, to each other, whether they be families, whether they be business associates. We know that that's going to be the way of the world for the long term. I agree with you, Mark. You know, as a CEO for a bunch of different companies over the, my career in retail and others, um, People need to be face to face to make some decisions, uh, you know, buy or sell, make plans, and uh, you know, build trust. And I, uh, I concur that uh, people will be getting back together in person when it when it's allowed and and frankly needed. Yeah, you know, this is our sixth uh, year of gathering the the only STEM symposium that focuses on aviation, and our curriculum continues to grow. It's been really amazing to me to see how well it's been going. But are these important? program's really important to people like yourself. Do you see the value in that? And a lot of educators ask me, is there going to be a future in aviation? And I say, I believe so, but I'd like to hear from you. Unquestionably, I think, Mark, you and I see it very much the same way. Uh, I can speak for United Airlines, and I can tell you that over the course of the last several months, we've retired nearly a 1,000 pilots uh, early through voluntary separation leaves. We've retired various other colleagues who have specialized skills again, through these voluntary programs to help uh, improve our financial circumstances as we make our way and navigate our way through this pandemic. And from the pilot perspective and the technician perspective, we have a lot more retirements coming up. Uh, the pandemic hasn't stopped the fact that people continue to age, that our workforce continues to age, and we're going to need to replace that aging workforce. And the fact that we are now uh, navigating our way through this pandemic doesn't mean that that process is going to stop. It only simply means that it's been delayed for a period of time. So from our perspective, it is as important as ever uh, to be focused on the youth of this nation and really introducing people uh, to aviation and to the opportunities that exist in this business that we know we are going to be making available to people in very short order. Well, I'd like to learn a little bit about your personal story because you came up through the ranks in aviation and as a flight instructor, which I consider to be one of the most important jobs in aviation all the way around, because uh, it's so important to lead people into aviation safely and then make the experience strong. But what was your own experience as a young person getting into aviation? The reality is, is that uh, I made sure that I put myself out there and I put myself in front of people and, and showed them that even though I was a young teenager, that I had the passion, that I had the interest, that I had the skills necessary uh, to be able to pursue that dream. And many people along the way gave me opportunities. So I advanced, I, I started answering telephones for a flying club at that local airport. Uh, that turned into being able to ferry airplanes around for them after I soloed when they needed maintenance work. Uh, turned into a job as a flight instructor, which turned into a job as a charter pilot and so on and so on. And that led me to where I am today at United Airlines. I've had a 35-year career here, uh, but I can tell you it all started uh, at an early age, and it was because my passion was there, and I made sure that when I presented myself to other people that I knew might someday have an opportunity to help me, I made sure that I left a good impression with them, and uh, sure enough, those folks were there to help lift me up as I was trying to advance uh, the rungs in, in the ladder of my career. Well, that's exactly right. You know, we've all had careers in different roles in different places, and, and there's rarely, rarely a straight line to the top. Uh, and I've lived through different kinds of uh, shocks and uh, financial you know, situations in the industries and, and other things that uh, require perseverance. And, and I've always thought that, you know, my uh, traits of having curiosity and combined with perseverance. I wonder how you think about that, because right now it's going to be not a direct line and not a straight line to that left seat of an airline, if that's what you want to be, or being a senior technician. It's going to be maybe a little bumpy, but you've lived through some of those bumps, right? About every 10 years, some event comes along uh, that sets us back 
uh, one or two steps, but yet we come back from it and we advance even further than we were before. And I think that's the very same circumstance we find ourselves in now. The fact of the matter is, if you have an interest in aviation and if you have a passion for aviation, this is the place to be. It is as fulfilling as you might dream it to be. And the opportunities are most certainly going to be there. The folks that are positioned right now to start working on those goals and to start working on those qualifications to get them to their dream job, whatever that happens to be, are the ones that are going to be perfectly positioned uh, to be at the front of the line when those opportunities do return. I would guess it's probably going to be sometime uh, in late 21 or sometime in 2022, but you're going to see airlines and aviation companies, I have no doubt, start to hire again. And so now is the time to buckle down. Now is the time to find ways to connect yourself with people and connect yourself with organizations that can help you get to where it is that you want to go. AOPA is certainly one of those organizations. Uh, we also have uh, an organization here at United Airlines that I work with very closely called Aviate. And uh, there's a lot of information available on how youth of this country can navigate their way to jobs at United Airlines. And I would encourage anybody that's interested in, in how the path to United Airlines is built to go see our website. It's uh, unitedaviate.com. And there's a lot of good information on there about kind of the pathways and bridges that we're building to try to connect youth and people that are interested in airlines and the aviation industry to United specifically, but also to other organizations out there as well. On behalf of AOPA, thank you and the entire United organization for supporting You Can Fly. Together we're making a big difference. I've always been impressed by the women and men who fly for the airlines. They move millions of people safely around the globe every day. But they're not the only pilots who inspire me. Meet a couple of pilots who fly very different ways for very different reasons. Aviation has changed their lives for the better, and now they want to inspire young people to discover what aviation could do for them. Meet AOPA's You Can Fly champions. Hey y'all, country music recording artist Dirk Spenley here. I'm Michael Goulian, a flight school owner and a professional air show pilot. There's maybe never been a better time to scope out a career in aviation. So many possibilities. Just think, while your friends are learning how to drive a car, you can be getting your pilot's license. And there's no better time than right now to get into aviation. Come meet me in the sky. It's amazing who you meet in the small world of aviation. Seeing the different ways those two use flying is one of the reasons why this industry is so impressive. Dirk Bentley is using aviation to get to his concerts and then go home to his family. Michael Goulian is teaching people to fly and thrilling the rest of us with his air show and racing performances. It's a great example of just how many ways you can be engaged in aviation, and there are so many types of aviation careers available to students. In my own work as an airline pilot, I depend on dispatchers who helped plan and manage our flights, maintenance technicians who keep our planes running, aerospace engineers who design our aircraft, air traffic controllers who help keep us safe in the skies, and technicians who ensure that the complex electronics in our aircraft are up to date. Chances are you're already familiar with many of those careers, and industry forecasts tell us there's going to be a huge demand for professionals in all of those areas in the coming years. But there are so many other career possibilities, some in newly emerging fields. A few days ago, I had the chance to meet with a group of aviation professionals who are making their mark in some very different aviation jobs. I was joined by Greg Bowles, Head of Government Affairs for Joby Aviation, a company that's helping to lead the way in developing an all-electric air taxi designed to be flown by human pilots. I was also jo joined by Major Afton Brown, an Air Force pilot who has flown hundreds of hours of combat missions and spent more than a thousand hours training her fellow pilots. And I also spoke with Chris Liebman, a civilian test engineer who loves military test aircraft and flies them at Edwards Air Force Base. They had some great advice for students who might want to follow in their footsteps or try other aviation careers. Here's what they had to say. So I'll go ahead and kick off our first topic, which is going to be focusing on jobs that are widely available now and jobs of the future. And I think each of us has a little bit to say. I guess I'll start with airlines, for instance. Even though right now during COVID-19, we've seen a sharp decline in commercial air travel in terms of airlines, Boeing actually just came out with a forecast that predicts over the next 10 to 20 years, 
we're still going to see that incremental growth that they were predicting even before the pandemic. So that's really excellent news. Anything around the airlines in terms of being a pilot, mechanic, things like that, I anticipate still continuing to do well. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I think that from our perspective, the future is really bright. Um, the way I kind of see things in the 1920s, a lot of us would have been an amazing time to be alive as an aviator. Um, they were cool times. But then the 1950s, the jet age, that was really something. Uh, and to be frank, we're on the verge of something called the electric age, right? So the electric age of aviation is going to be even bigger than the jet age, far bigger than the 1920s. And so it is an amazing time to be a young person coming into aviation. Uh, we're designing all new vehicles. As engineers, we're finding brand new ground. We're cutting brand new ground with, with electric and what it lets us do. It's not just propulsion, but we mix propulsion into control. Uh, and so there are just huge opportunities flying these new aircraft, designing these new aircraft manufacturing. It's, it truly is like the coolest time to be in aviation right now. Yeah, this is, this is a growth period uh, the way I see it. So um, from the Air Force civil servant side, uh, so I'm not active duty. I, I, I'm a civilian working for the uh, U.S. government. It's a really cool time because there are a lot of big projects that are uh, currently at Edwards Air Force Base, as well as uh, soon to be inbound. So there's uh, new fighters, new bombers. There are new presidential aircraft. Um, there is so many different um, aspects of aviation. Uh, one of the big ones that I see is the unmanned market, particularly uh, in what we call emerging technologies. So the idea of automation, the idea of, um, you know, multiple aircraft flying in formation. Uh, if you get enough of them, you call it a swarm. Um, there's a lot of engineering. There's a lot of really technical, hard problems to solve. And I think that's going to be uh, such an awesome opportunity for folks coming into the uh, into the world. We will always have a need for diverse, talented individuals to come and fly and be and participate in our aviation careers. We have multiple different aviation careers, not just pilots, but we'll always need really smart air battle managers, combat systems operators, and remotely piloted aircraft pilots to come in to help serve and defend our nation. So as we are going through this COVID period right now, just know that there will always be a job for you, whether you'd like to go active duty, whether you'd like to serve part-time in the Guard Reserve, or even full-time in this components. Um, it is always going to be something that is going to be an option. And so if that's something that you would like to do, finding a mentor and kind of learning more about those careers is going to be something that you're going to want to get into or get your students into. What is one thing that you guys would tell students in relation to COVID-19 about their future career? When I was a freshman in college, uh, the first two weeks of college, that was when 9-11 happened. Everyone was really concerned about the future of the industry. What is going to happen? Where are things going to go? By the time I graduated college uh, in uh, 2006, the airline market was on fire. Uh, engineering was on fire. There was a lot of hiring going on. So while I see the, the COVID issues as kind of a, a short-term uh, temporary, uh, temporary setback, I see a lot of opportunity that you know, we can't overcome. Uh, you know, retirements are going to continue to happen. Technology is going to continue to develop. Um, there are always going to be minor setbacks, no matter if it's COVID or personal or whatever. But if you're passionate about something, you should go after it and never let anything stand in your way. So if aviation is what fuels you, then go find that perfect aviation job. I would uh, I would 100% agree. And Greg, I think you would say the same thing too. If you're passionate about aviation and it's something you want to get in, there will be roadblocks. Aviation really is um, you know, like a wave. There are going to be ups and downs it's constant. It's a part of the aviation industry. So making sure that you're prepared for that, but realizing that there's nothing else that you would rather do, I think is the best you know, attitude to go into it. And real quick, for the last uh, point that we want to bring up real, uh, real quick, guys, just a piece of advice that you would offer for a student or a teacher in the aviation field um, about their future careers, about how they want to angle themselves to get into a career or a job or teach a student how to get into a career or job that they would absolutely love to have. Everybody wants to work with folks that, that can make the job happen and can, can accomplish the task at hand. And almost all of that involves uh, deciding that you're going to make it be successful and keeping that positive attitude. 
And I will tell you that day in and day out, I work with some of the most amazing people I ever run into in the aviation field. I think it naturally draws these can-do people. And that is definitely part of what makes this so exciting. One of the best things that you can do is find a mentor, someone who is doing what you are, what you want to do. Find someone who's doing that now and talk with them. Find out how they got to where they are. Um, if you don't know anyone, go to an air show, go to, uh, you know, go to online uh, events, find people who are doing what you're doing and talk to them. Find out what their interests are and what their path was to get to, uh, to, get to where they are. I appreciate it. There's so many cool careers out there in aviation, so I'm glad we were able to highlight at least four of sort of the big, big aspects. Um, again, for those of you who are teachers or students going through this, this is something that we're all passionate about. If it's something that you're interested in, highly recommend that you find somebody and reach out and begin networking as early as possible. It really is all about who you know, not what you know in aviation. Well, talking with them was great, and I learned a lot, but I want to hear what you think. So what's going on with the chat desk? The chat has been incredibly active tonight. It's been great. Thanks to all of you who are taking part in the discussions. We have teachers watching from coast to coast, and we have some high school students who have joined as well. I'd love to give a special shout out to Eli, who's in New Jersey. He is a sophomore, and he's already started taking flying lessons which is awesome that you've become involved that early on. And all of us at AOPA wish you all the best in your flight training. We saw in the video the importance of mentorship. And one question that we get a lot is, what if I don't have any aviation connections? How can I go about establishing those kinds of mentorships? And there are a few things that you can do. One, I would say that social media influencers can be a great source of information. <laughs> You can find them in a wide variety of aviation careers, and they can be a great way to gather information. Uh, for example, Swain, if um, teachers have any students who are interested in becoming an airline pilot, he would be a great one to watch. Beyond that, I would suggest having your students set up a LinkedIn account and using that as a way to reach out to other people who are in the aviation community. And then finally, I really can't overstate the importance of just going to your local airport. You will find, regardless of the size of your airport, that there are going to be people there that have a very deep aviation knowledge. A lot of them would be only too happy to get your students started and give them advice, and they'll likely have a lot of connections. So we'll be continuing to monitor chats throughout the evening, so don't hesitate to reach out if you have a question or just to say hello. Yeah, guys, fill up that chat room. Please ask questions. We have a whole team behind the scenes. Thank you for your questions and comments. I really appreciate hearing from all of you. So let's talk about one of the big challenges that many aspiring aviators face, paying for flight training. Learning to fly can be a major investment, but AOPA can help with scholarships of up to $10,000 each for both students and teachers. We talked with the programs manager to find out more. My name is Taz Thomas, I'm the scholarship program manager here at AOPA and what I do is I manage the application process and award management for all of our scholarships. I really, really love my job um, and what I love about it is that I get to the opportunity to work with aspiring pilots and pilots who are motivated, eager and passionate about learning about aviation. The interesting thing about the feedback I get from our scholarship program is that without the means of our scholarships, they wouldn't have the means to fly and knowing that means every to me because I know that between the donors, myself, and committee, we are that intricate part in getting them to accomplishing their goals. They are extremely grateful to receive our scholarships and when I speak with them, a few of them spoke with me and they let me know that they were able to volunteer for the hurricane relief in the Bahamas in North Carolina and that, that made me very proud. But we have four different types of scholarship, high school, teacher, primary, and advanced and the criteria is different for each scholarship and we have everything outlined on our website. With the teachers, it's very interesting because they're teaching the STEM program, um, what they let me know is that they have more confidence in teaching the program because they have that hand-on experience with receiving their pilot pilot certificate. For the 2021 scholarship application process, the deadline will be February 14th at 11.59 Eastern Standard Time. So after we receive all of the application um, and the deadline closes, we have a scholarship 
committee who goes through every application and so we have our internal process for selecting the final winners. A successful application um, is first completed. So that's the minimum is that everything's completed. So once you complete the essay requirements, you also have to submit two letters of recommendations. Um, we also want to see passion for general aviation. We want to see how a recipient is going to not only complete the training but contribute to general aviation after they complete their training. I would say it boils down to passion, passion, passion. Um, we need the passion to like seep through the application. Um, we want to know that this is your dream, this, this is your goal, and it's not coming from somewhere else or someone else. So you definitely should complete the entire application. Uh, make sure both letters of recommendation are submitted. Um, one of the do nots is do not have someone else complete the application for you. Um, we want to see that you are able to complete the application and again that this passion is coming from you. If you have a passion for flying and you don't have the financial means then you definitely should apply because we can be that bridge to help you get towards your goals on completing that certificate. So if you're a teacher using the AOPA curriculum, you can apply for a scholarship and so can your students. As Taz said, applications open on December 1st on the AOPA website. But what if you're not using the curriculum yet? What can it do for you and your students? Let's hear from a teacher who knows. Dr. Kevin Conan is a 2020 AOPA scholarship winner and a math and aviation teacher at the Sanborn Regional High School in Kingston, New Hampshire. And here's what he had to say about bringing AOPA's uh, curriculum right into the classroom. So the other day, my students did the balloon rocket activity. And uh, you, if you walked by my classroom, you would have sworn we were having a party in here. It was so loud. The kids were so excited. Before, I was sort of a book guy. Here are some notes, here are some practice problems. But now with the aviation curriculum, the AOPA curriculum, I see how important it is to uh, have the students write down some notes, then maybe watch a video or two on it to help those visual learners. And then let's have a, a hands-on activity for the kinesthetic learners and then we can uh, put it all together, and I think it's a much better way to learn. This curriculum is a complete package. I can't emphasize that enough. Everything you need, you have in this curriculum. You're definitely going to want to stay with us to see the newest curriculum developments. But why don't we check in with the chat desk to see what else our audience is saying. Yes, Swain. Um, we have a lot of chats going on. I would like to give a shout out to Matthew, who is another sophomore that has actually just started his flight training. And that is awesome, Matthew. Keep up the good work, and we really wish you all the best. We heard from Taz about the different scholarships that are available. And one question that we often get in relation to the scholarships is, what if I've already started my flight training? Am I still able to apply for AOPA scholarships? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, even if you've started your primary flight training, you can apply for a scholarship. If you're awarded the scholarship, you can use it to help finish your training. And then if you have any money left over at the end, you can actually apply that to an advanced rating. So if you want to start your instrument or your commercial, you could then use the scholarship money for that. So back to you, Swain. Well, so far, we've talked a lot here about the projected need for pilots, engineers, mechanics, and more. But how are we going to fill those jobs? We're going to do it by attracting a diverse group of young people to learn about and pursue these careers. Traditionally, aviation careers, like most STEM careers, have not attracted very many women or minorities. But the aviation industry wants to see that change. Right now, there are amazing organizations all across the country focused on increasing diversity in aviation. And as a member of the National Gay Pilots Association myself, this is an issue that's important to me personally. So I'm very pleased to share our next panel with you. Let's take a look. Thank you for tuning in to today's session entitled, Someone Who Looks Like Me. I'm Lakeisha Partman, Vice President of HR Inclusion and Diversity for AOPA. I am honored to be hosting today's session and to be joined by three esteemed 
uh, individuals within the aviation community. Before we start the conversation, I'd like to turn it over to the panelists to give them an opportunity to introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Vanessa Blackmell Jameson. I'm currently the chair of the Organization of Black Aerospace Professionals. It's been the last four years, and I also work with the FAA and have been in the aviation industry for over 43 years. Allison. Hi, I'm Allison McKay. I am the CEO of Women in Aviation International. I have spent my career in aviation, uh, but not in the traditional sense of flying or fixing or manufacturing. I've been more on the sales and marketing side and, um, and on the, uh, the development of programs that can help um, kids like you enter our industry. Houston. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Captain Houston Mills. I'm the uh, Vice President of Flight Operations and Safety uh, for UPS Airlines. I'm a, uh, a 30 plus year veteran in aviation. I started off with the Marine Corps as an F-18 fighter pilot for nine years and then with UPS for 26 years. I'm a past chairman of uh, OPAP and uh, currently on the Board of Advisors, so happy to be here. Thank you so much for those introductions. I think most of us, anyway, on the phone know that the pilot population in general isn't the most diverse as it stands right now. And many of you, have really been instrumental in really moving the needle in that space. So the question I have for each of you is, you know, why does it matter? Why is diversity important for the future of aviation? Well, I think if we look just at the number of pilots that we need uh, going forward once this pandemic is uh, behind us, there is no way we will staff all of the positions with the traditional methods that we have had, which is a typically male, a white male audience. Um, so just from numbers alone, we have got to uh, redefine how we uh, recruit and staff uh, those positions. Well, you know, first of all, I think it's important because, you know, aviation you know, brings people together, right? It's, it's one of the, it's the industry that literally connects the world. It connects a global community. And the world is diverse, right? The, so if we're going to serve customers around the world, we say this at UPS all the time, then it's very important that we've got a group of folks who look like the world. So that's probably one of the biggest reasons why diversity is important. And the second, I think, is it's just a wonderful career opportunity. You know, as uh, technology continues to take more and more jobs, as manufacturing starts to transition and the service industry starts to evolve, you know, aviation is really one of those, 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 those remaining thresholds. Uh, where, you know, really good paying jobs where people can, you know, you know raise a family, you know, have a wonderful, uh, you know, career and do everything that they want. Uh, it's, it's, it's a phenomenal thing. So from a diversity perspective, you know, I'm ensuring that uh, people of color and women are included in this amazing uh, field that continues to expand. People simply just aren't aware of this industry. So by, by us making an intended effort to ensure that diversity is brought in front and being inclusive, I think that we can definitely uh, make our industry better as well as more productive because, again, diversity in thought is what it's all about. But we have a big gap in that um, there's so many minorities and females that are just unaware of this opportunity. What advice would you give to teachers who are maybe teaching a class where they are t they have students who are underrepresented and you know I know you've talked about awareness and being reflective of oneself but anything else you could offer when they're in that particular situation so I would say that you know from a teacher and counselor perspective it's um, you think about uh, you know Black History Month uh, perhaps highlighting aviation uh, obviously, you've got all the traditional things, but you very rarely hear about aviation outside of the, the Tuskegee Airmen. But there's a very rich history there, a very rich story. And, and surprising and to say, you know, the, you know, the African American and, and, and commercial aviation, myself included, as a captain at a major airline, you know, it didn't happen until Marlon Green took it to the Supreme Court back in 1963. And um, after Dave Harris, an American, uh, American Airlines uh, pilot and, and dear friend, a former uh, OBAT member, you know, broke that barrier in 1964, followed by Mr. Green himself in 1965. You know, so the history is very interesting. Those Tuskegee Airmen, those heroes you know, who fought in World War II, didn't come home to, to opportunities because of, you know, the, uh, the systemic racism and, and other discriminatory, uh, discri discriminatory things that were going on. So educating students in terms of, hey, you know, these platforms, you know, have uh, been, uh, been built. These roads have been paved. And now there's tremendous opportunities out there. So that would be one of the things I would 
you know, add out there for, for teachers to think about as well. I'm just shaking my head because I just, I, when, he, when Houston was going through that his uh, rich history, and I was thinking of all the names, and, and uh, OBAP was founded by Ben Thomas because he couldn't get into the airline industry with Eastern Airlines. So that education alone, but um, to, to go to your question too about um, when, when the students or let's say majority uh, white kids that are in school and, and there are a few minorities and what could the teachers do? Well, the teachers themselves can a- actually reach out, <clears throat> excuse me, and ensure that the kids are learning from each other and using those opportunities to have discussions about that history, that rich history that's there and opening doors to educate and understand that in this industry, it's, it's a wide open space, but here's where there's some issues that concern. So what can we do about it? How can we help and educate others about this history? And using those students to broaden their horizon on that education. And just a small component, I didn't even learn about the Tuskegee Airmen until I was actually recruiting pilots and um, because it just wasn't taught in school. So that in itself, I'm a living example of not knowing my history because it wasn't taught to me at an early age. I grew up in a county that was predominantly black, went to an HBCU, and then went on to a predominantly white university where I was probably one of five diverse students in my graduating class. So it was very different for me to go from being surrounded by people who looked like me to being very different. What would you say, and I'll kick this over to Allison, to students who might be in that position, what would you say to them to remain encouraged as they go through and, you know, pursue careers in aviation? Teachers have such a power to educate, Mm -hmm. to show a um, a diverse group of um, stories relative to aviation. Um, there are people of all color and all gender that, um, that make this industry great, that were really pioneers in one way or another. Um, so focus on the stories, the people that were coming before you that really um, had to, to blaze a trail to get you where you are um, and, and hold on to those, those people as, as your mentors when things get challenging, when you feel like you are swimming upstream. Um, you know, people swam upstream before you and they, they achieved greatness. Um, so I, I think that just remember what your passion is and just keep pushing it every day. So just one final um, topic to cover before we end our session. And it actually, I'm hoping that you can share something personal, um, something that maybe really helped you to keep plugging along when you were new in this career that could maybe be inspirational to someone, teacher, student, anyone who's watching this? So coming up, I um, was told that I would be a super leader and that I was put in a lot of leadership development programs and nothing ever materialized. So that became a disappointment. But I realized that I have to believe in myself. And I had a strong mom who encouraged me to to try and to do things. So what I would say to anyone is that, again, mentorship is vital. It is important, but you have to believe in yourself. Understand that you're going to run into obstacles. That's a part of life. But have faith. Understand that you have someone that's guiding you in the direction that you need to go, but believe in yourself and you are capable of doing anything. The sky is the limit. Thank you so much. And thank you all for participating in today's discussion. I think that, um, well, I personally enjoyed it and I hope that those who tune in also enjoy it as well. Thank you. Thank you. It's clear that focusing on inclusion can open doors for people who might not have considered a career in aviation. So can scholarships. And coming up in just a moment, we're going to learn about how the U.S. Air Force is creating opportunities for a new generation of aviators. But before we do, I want you to hear from a young woman who embodies the promise of the future. And I'm telling you, the Air Force is going to want to keep an eye on her. Hi, my name is Ruth Anand, and I'm from Akron, Ohio, and a 2019 AOPA scholarship recipient. 
So through my flying journey, I really developed into someone who's a calm and confident pilot and person. But throughout this whole journey, the accomplishment I'm most proud of is receiving my private pilot's license. So getting my private pilot's license was not an easy journey. I had a concussion which delayed my flying progress, as well as the airport being shut down to COVID-19. But the moment that the checkride examiner shook my hand and told me, congratulations, Ruth, you're now an official private pilot, that was definitely the happiest moment of my life. But what made that feeling even greater was now the knowledge that I can share my love of flying with others, which I did for my little brother who had never been flying before. And my whole journey has come full circle from someone once sharing their love of flying with me to now me being able to share my love of flying with others. So after high school, I would really like to attend the United States Air Force Academy and become a fighter pilot for the Air Force. And without the, this AOPs flight training scholarship, I would have never been able to have my private pilot license when I'm 17 years old and a senior in high school. That's something I just wouldn't be able to say right now. My flight training might not have started till I was in college or even beyond college. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity I've had to pursue my dreams and pursue my passion and go flying. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. I know you have a packed schedule today, so I'll jump right in. I'd like to start by thanking you and the entire AOPA team for giving me this opportunity to talk about one of my favorite subjects, aviation. I'm Major General Bill Spangenthal, the Deputy Commander of Air Education and Training Command. We are responsible for recruiting, training, and educating every airman that joins our Air Force. In fact, we train more than 290,000 students a year across all aviation jobs, from flight engineers to airborne mission system specialists, from in-flight refuelers to tanker pilots, and from remotely piloted aircraft pilots to fighter pilots. If your students have a passion for flight, we have a position for them to excel. So speaking of passion, I'd like to briefly talk about how the intersection of inspiration and opportunity will drive the next generation of aviators. I'm the son of an Air Force mechanic, my dad, Dale Spangenthal, who is a retired senior master sergeant. It was his encouragement to join the Air Force that started early in my life. However, it was a Cessna flight I'd won in a model building contest combined with dad's inspiration and his mentoring that sent me, really set me on fire for aviation. And what followed was an opportunity to attend the Air Force Academy, flight training in fast jets, and a career in big jets that set me around the globe and on one adventure after another. Today I'm speaking to you having accomplished more than I could have imagined, having spent a career doing the thing I love as part of the greatest military in the world. That all started with a mentor, my dad, who inspired me along with that key opportunity, that Cessna flight and going to the Air Force Academy. I think that is precisely why you are here today and why what you are doing is so important for these young students and to our nation. If your students have a passion for serving, or they want to take advantage of all the benefits the Air Force has to offer, we are looking for motivated individuals to join our team. In the Air Force, students will get cutting edge training and technologically advanced aircraft and build a ton of other key skills such as confidence, leadership, stress management, the ability to focus and to multitask, just to name a few. Students also have access to free college and the best flight training programs in the world. Speaking of those programs, we offer many incredible opportunities for students, such as our new Aim High Flight Academy. The program connects teenagers with a desire to fly with aviators, really mentors, across the Air Force. And it familiarizes students with, an, with aviation through an instructed solo flight at no cost to the student. Just think, 
these students not only receive flight experience, but they also get to interact with actual pilots from airframes such as our B-52 Stratofortress, our F-35 Lightning II, the V-22 Osprey, or the C-17 Globemaster, which is near and dear to my heart. These officer mentors come from every platform in the Air Force inventory and will include U.S. Space Force teammates. While the emphasis is flying, the training will provide character development, time management, goal setting, and other critical topics. The end result is twofold. First, the students will be well positioned when applying for Air Force pilot slots. And second, they will cultivate key skills that will benefit them throughout their lives. We want America's best and brightest, and we are committed to ensuring these aspiring aviators are not encumbered by cost, geography, or any other limiting factor. Students can further apply for the Air Force Academy and receive an elite and free education from one of the leading universities in the country. Students can also compete to receive scholarships at, at over 1,100 colleges across the country while participating in our Reserve Officer Training Corps program. In order to stay on the leading edge of aviation technology, we need the best and brightest students from diverse backgrounds who will bring a variety of thoughts and ideas to the table. We need people who are ready to challenge themselves and the status quo to be the best possible version of, the, of themselves and who will rally around a love of freedom and a love of flight. In Air Education and Training Command, we have embraced student-centered learning and we are transforming the way we create pilots. We are capitalizing on modern tools, methods, and learning processes to create a better pilot and a better airman. Please know your Air Force is at the forefront of aviation innovation. We are pushing the limits of training by incorporating immersive technologies, such as augmented and virtual reality, for example, and experimenting with remote simulator operations that rival anything in the civilian setting. I could go on and on, but I must conclude. The Air Force, like AOPA, cherishes the freedom to fly. We are moving aggressively to accelerate change within aviation and need the greatest minds to be part of our team. We are counting on your inspiration and your motivation to connect aviation-minded students with the amazing opportunities in civil flying and in the United States Air Force. Thank you again for this opportunity to speak to you today, and thank you more importantly for making a difference in the lives of our youth. If you have any questions about the discussion from today, we have Air Force teammates online now to assist you and to help you with some answers. Be sure to take advantage of this opportunity to chat with the Air Force representatives who are joining us live in the chat. Just type your question into the box on your screen. You know, teachers are always finding innovative ways to help students connect with the material they teach, and there's almost no better place to really connect with aviation than at the airport. So we visited the AOPA ambassador in Florida to find out how teachers can get their students involved beyond the classroom. Whether your student's interest in general aviation leads to a career path or it remains a hobby, either way, their involvement in aviation can open up an unbelievably large spectrum of opportunities, many of which they can't even imagine yet. It's no secret the work you do with your students in the classroom is critically important. In fact, it's the basis for everything that will come afterwards for them. But you might start wondering, how do I get my students involved with real aircraft down at the actual airport? Luckily, we can do that. Believe it or not, it's not that hard or that expensive for you to get involved in general aviation. There are a lot of opportunities for your students and you to get involved in a hands-on way with real aircraft. Let's take a look at a few of those opportunities right now. If you've got students with an interest in the military, the Civil Air Patrol might be a great option. The Civil Air Patrol is the civilian auxiliary of the United States Air Force, and they accept cadets as young as 12 years old. The Civil Air Patrol operates a large fleet of single-engine aircraft which help them accomplish their missions. Those missions include search and rescue and providing support for emergencies. They also do orientation flights for their cadets. Why not consider doing an airport day? 
You'd be surprised, but to your local airport manager, you, your students, their parents, their friends, their neighbors, their siblings, they all represent potential new customers. Getting together with your local airport manager to discuss holding an airport day on their field with your students can be a great way to get involved in aviation. The EAA, or the Experimental Aircraft Association, has chapters from coast to coast at airports large and small all over our country. The members of the EAA chapters generally are involved in building aircraft like this, but they also fly them. One of the EAA's most successful programs is known as Young Eagles. You can arrange with your local EAA chapter to have a Young Eagles Day where your students and you may get the opportunity to go fly yourselves. You can find a local EAA chapter by going to the National Organization's website, eaa.org. Click on the Find a Chapter tab and you'll find contact information there for whatever's in your area. Maybe the most productive option available to you and your students is to find a flying club in your area. If there isn't one, go ahead and form one of your own. The Lakeland Aero Club is a flying club specifically designed to serve high school students here in Lakeland, Florida. I'm here with Sean Stoltz, uh, Vice President of the Lakeland Aero Club, a senior at Central Florida Aerospace Academy. So I soloed on my 16th birthday whenever I was a sophomore in high school. Got my private pilot's license as soon as I turned 17, and then I've been kept moving up. I'm currently uh, instrument rated and commercially rated pilot single engine multi-engine and we're currently working on my CFI. Now I can help these freshmen that are coming up through and barely know which side of the screwdriver used to bang in a nail <laughs> and actually teach them, all right, here's how we're going to work on airplanes, here's how we're going to fly airplanes, here's really just how we're operating in the shop and kind of take them under my wing the same way other people have done that to me. A flying club can focus on any aspect of aviation you find interesting. Perhaps they do restoration or maintenance, or maybe they fly aircraft. Maybe they fly drones. Whatever it is you're interested in doing, you can find or found a flying club to do exactly that. Now you may be thinking, how am I gonna get all those networking connections? I'm a high school teacher, I'm not a professional pilot. Well, luckily, you have a connection to AOPA. My name is Jamie Beckett. I'm AOPA's You Can Fly Ambassador in Florida. I'm a flight instructor, I'm an airframe and power plant mechanic, and I write about aviation for a living as well. Networking is the key to being successful in getting your students out to the airport and getting the most out of the STEM education curriculum. Fortunately, you've got great connections through AOPA, and every one of us is happy to help you whenever you need us. This is the good news. Whatever you want to do with your students at the airport, that's probably available to you. Whether you want to participate in an airport day, go for a Young Eagles flight with an EAA chapter, get involved with the Civil Air Patrol for a military experience, whether you want to start or join a flying club, restore a 1930s Curtis Jr. like this one, build a brand new kit aircraft, or buy a certified airplane. And don't forget flying drones, because you can do that too. So give us a call, drop us an email. Let us know how we can help you and your students achieve your dreams. We'll be here for you. You just heard Jamie talk about the great ways that you can get your students out to the airport and get them flying. Personally, my first ride in an airplane was with the EAA Young Eagles. And then I also joined the Civil Air Patrol and had a lot of great experiences that way too. I'd like to share a little bit more with you about how the AOPA can help your students start a flying club. My name is Drew Myers, and I'm the manager of the Flying Clubs Initiative. Flying clubs are a great way to get students engaged at the airport, and it really helps enhance the classroom learning experience. It provides hands-on skills and allows students to interact with pilots and the airport environment. Flying clubs can take many forms. You can build, fly drones, and more. You can find flying clubs in your area by using our online flying club finder. If you can't find one, we'd be happy to help you form one. We have tools designed to help anyone start a flying club. We have an online resource library with a guide to starting a flying club. We have sample documents of bylaws and lease agreements. We also put on frequent webinars and seminars specifically designed to help you get a club formed. We also have one-on-one -on -one help from our expert staff. We've helped over 160 flying clubs form and we'd be happy to help you get yours off the ground. Additionally, we're bringing all these resources together into a convenient package designed specifically for high school flying clubs. You'll be able to access that very soon on our website. Starting a club is easier than you think, and we're here to help. To learn more, drop us an email or visit our website.
So many great ways to expand learning beyond the classroom and take it all the way to the airport. Civil Air Patrol, Young Eagles, Flying Clubs. I'm sure many of you have questions. So again, let's go ahead and check in with the chat desk and see what uh, questions we have. We have been getting some questions, Wayne. Uh, first off, I would like to give a big thank you, though, to Lieutenant Colonel Annie Driscoll and Major Afton Brown, both of whom are with the U.S. Air Force and have joined us in the chat answering people's questions. Uh, we get a lot of questions about flying clubs from high schools. And one question that we get a lot is, who can start a flying club? And do you have to be a pilot and own an airplane to start a flying club? Well, starting a club can seem a little intimidating, but the good news is that to get started, you don't need to be a pilot or own an airplane. A school, a student, a teacher can start a club, and there is a lot of flexibility involved. Flying clubs can be every bit as diverse as the people that start them. And there's a lot you can do in terms of creating a club that has the organization and the mission that you're looking for. So if you want to start a club, please don't hesitate to reach out to AOPA, flyingclubnetwork at aopa.org. We've also been getting a lot of questions about the curriculum. Thomas Wolford from Menifee County Schools in Kentucky is just one teacher that has said that he's tuned in because he's interested in adopting AOPA's curriculum, hopefully. And so to all of those teachers, I would just like to say um, stay tuned because we have a segment coming up that will walk you through all four years of AOPA's curriculum. Perfect. Thanks for that. And keep asking questions in the chat, guys. One of the keys to getting students to the airport and having great experiences is building community partnerships to support them. At Highlands Aviation Academy in Florida, one teacher put together a community coalition that allowed his students to build an airplane for a retired astronaut. AOPA's Director of High School Outreach, Glenn Ponis, caught up with this group recently, and they've got some tips for teachers and schools that want to create special experiences for their own students. John, you've spent the last 20 years building the Highlands Aviation and Aerospace Program, and you took it from a single class into a full-blown aviation career development program with multiple corporate government individual partners. When you began this 20 years ago, who did you decide to reach out to first and, and why? And what were some of the initial goals, the specific goals that you had in your initial collaboration efforts? So it was the airport and obviously the school board where I was teaching the workforce board. Um, and then the next thing we brought in was um, the local radio control club, because the first year when I started the program, we built a two-place Challenger experimental aircraft in my shop. I couldn't get 24 kids involved in it all the time, so the next year we went a different route and we did the partnership with the radio controlled aircraft with the radio control club. And that, that got everybody building airplanes, flying airplanes, and then we'd go out to the airport and fly Young Eagles. And that's, that's how it started. So John, as we look to other schools, what would you say to them as they plan their conversations with potential program partners? I think in terms of their interest and then, um, you know, make sure that as every time you do something that that's an accomplishment, no matter how small, document it because people want to support a program that gets things done. So my next question is for Phil Lockwood. Now, Phil, you've built an immensely successful aircraft company selling over 250 air cams since building the prototype for National Geographic in 1995. Given that huge success, both you and your staff must have time commitments and meet production deadlines. What got you interested in working with the Highlands Aviation and Aerospace Program? For me, it was a perfect opportunity to give back to the community and to uh, do something for the next generation. So Phil, you've had a chance to work with John and Mike and the students. You've had a chance to watch them build a lot of airplanes over time. What would you say about their work ethic and the quality of the build that they do? You know, we had just the right people and, and just the, the right number of people overseeing the kids. So you always had the same people who are in charge and, uh, and we were in control of who was working on the plane and when uh, so that you didn't have other people coming in that maybe weren't familiar with what was going on. So it was very, they did a great job of making sure that the work was done properly and, and the quality was as good as I've ever seen from anyone. 
my next question is for Mike Halpern. Mike, your experience has been unique as your background is neither as an aviation teacher nor a pilot. Yet here you are, you're a key player in a highly successful aviation-based STEM and CTE pathway program. You're building these airplanes. Tell us about your background, your certification area, some of the experiences that you had, how you got involved in this, and really what it's like being a technical education teacher who teaches students how to build airplanes. I've been in education for 16 years and Prior to my career in education, I ran printing companies in the Northeast. And what I tell all my students as they come through this program is that the skills that you're learning in this program are all transferable skills. Whether your goal is to be a pilot or be in the aviation industry, that, you know, that, that's one thing. But if not, you can take everything you learn in this program, apply it to any other industry. Um, it's, it's, extremely beneficial to be involved in something like this. In fact, I'm using transferable skills in this program. Things that I've learned in, in the past prior to aviation, I've transferred into this program and that's what's helped make it a success. Story, you're a retired NASA astronaut. Most people don't know you're a physician, a computer scientist, an aerospace physiology researcher. Your time's incredibly valuable. And I know you had an interest in purchasing an air cam and you would have had the airplane built by the team in a relatively short period of time. Instead, you chose to work side by side with a group of students to build your airplane. What motivated you to do that? And what did you find interesting about the process? The spirit of learning, the spirit of development and acquisition of skills the spirit of doing it right, and the spirit of helping each other. Every time I saw a tool at work, there were four to six hands on it, including Mike, including John, including Phil. So they were there to instruct us all the time. But the kit now, you don't just put that together like an director said. You are in the details of cutting sheet metal and the folding it, holding it in place, drilling the holes and doing the rivets and all that stuff. <clears throat> but these kids, um, it's incredibly exciting to see them get so involved. The important thing about children is how engaged are they in the world? How engaged in all of that process and they were massively engaged. What they're building, they are going to fly. Every one of those kids is gonna fly their machine. So the teamwork and older children helping, you know, the younger children and uh, the hands-on and so STEM is one thing, but this is a different way to learn aeronautics, to learn how to read a drawing and to follow the procedures, to follow the checklist of putting it together. So it's the whole spirit of, uh, of doing things right. It's the spirit of teamwork. It's the spirit of developing my skills in life. So my next question is for Nicole Blunt. Nicole, you've been a student in the Highlands Aviation and Aerospace Program for the past three and a half years. You were a key player in building that beautiful aircraft that's behind Story there. I'm curious, what's your favorite memory of your time in the program and of the airplane build? I think my favorite memory from this program was the first day that I came here. So we had an orientation for the aerospace program here at the EAA hangar at Sebring Airport. And I was coming in with no prior aviation experience. I had never had any technical experience either. I'd never even flown in a small aircraft. And I thought I would walk in and be very intimidated and feel kind of on the outside of everything that's going on. Um, but walking in, it was just the most welcoming environment. And... They, they just welcomed me in and showed me that like I can do these things right off the bat. So Mike, as a teacher who was not a pilot, no aviation experience, and you're going to be teaching a curriculum like the AOPA High School Aviation STEM curriculum, how did you go about doing that? What sort of supports did AOPA offer? And what was that experience like growing into an aviation teacher? So the great part about the AOPA curriculum is for someone like me who does not have an aviation background or didn't prior to this working in the, in the uh, academy, um, everything that a teacher needs is included in the curriculum. The PowerPoints are well-developed, there's resources embedded, and anything that I need to, to you know, gain more background knowledge on, I simply click on the links, I follow the resources, and everything that I need is right there. 
So, John, there are people that are sitting out there right now looking at what you've done over the last 20 years, taking this from a single class to being a full-blown CTE program. They're sitting there saying, there's no way that I can do all of that. I'm going to have a hard enough time simply doing a curriculum and learning this because I'm not an, I'm not an aerospace teacher. I'm not a pilot. What kind of advice would you have to them if you're just starting this program? What would you say to them about their first steps? Get involved first. Uh, in the AOPA curriculum, that, that's a key component. If you have a clear idea of what your, your goal is and your mission, when you have resources and things come your way, you measure whatever you're going to do and whatever you're going to expend resources on that mission. If our program, if whatever we do, whatever we spend money and time on, if it doesn't support the idea of building uh, youth aviation education, we don't do it. Um, and so you have to understand what your mission is, stay true to that, and anything you do and anything you, you attempt to move on to, if it doesn't support that mission, think about why you're doing it. So um, on behalf of Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, the You Can Fly High School Initiative, I want to thank each of you. I want to thank uh, Phil for your time today, Story, for, for, the, for, the, for the time and effort that you put in to work with the kids, both of you, um, to John and to, and to Michael for your unswerving dedication, not just to the AOPA curriculum, but to the entire process of education. And Nicole, for for your hard work and the fact that, it, that you've been able to parlay it into what looks like an incredibly bright future, I want to thank each of you for your time today and for your insight. I think this is going to make a fantastic opportunity for people to learn from the work that you all have done together to put together a fantastic program at Highlands Aviation and Aerospace um, Institute. Thank you all so much. My pleasure. Thank you. What an incredible opportunity for those students. And it's a model that other schools can follow. Not everyone may get to build an airplane for an astronaut, but anyone can begin building support in their community. And don't forget the opportunities available at the national level. Major General Spangenthal told us about the AIM High Academy. Let's check it out. I'm Lieutenant Kelsey Owens, and I'm training to become a pilot in the United States Air Force. But before I joined the Air Force, the AIM High Flight Academy gave me the skills and confidence I needed to fly. It's a three-week program where you get the hands-on experience of flying an aircraft, and you also get one-on-one -on -one experience with Air Force instructors. There were students from all over the country. It was pretty awesome seeing all of us come together and share like this one common interest. They pay for your room and board, your meals, and they pay for all your flight hours. If I were to go to the private side, 13 flight hours it would cost me about $4,000. My most memorable moment from the program was being able to solo. I came in not having a single flight hour, but I just remember looking over to where the co-pilot was normally sitting and she wasn't there and I was like, oh wow. If you're a high school or college student and you're interested in flying, this program is for you. What an opportunity. Three weeks of training, hours of flight time, and even room and board at no cost to students. Okay, well, we've been talking a lot about how you can expand learning beyond the classroom, but now it's time to focus on what happens inside the classroom because that's where students can get the fundamentals for any aviation career that might spark their passion. For the past several years, AOPA has been developing, testing, and delivering free aviation curriculum to high school students. Here to tell us more about what's in the curriculum and how your school can use it are Eric Yates, AOPA's Director of Curriculum Development, and Thomas Eaton, Coordinator for the High School Initiative. Thank you, Swain. I'm Eric Yates. I've been teaching all over the world for 25 years, and I've been flying even longer. While I'm qualified to fly an airliner, I love being in the classroom. So working on our curriculum is a great way for me to combine my passions for aviation and education. Now, like Swain, I was a high school student when I began dreaming about a career in aviation. And some of your students may be doing the same. Today, you'll hear about how our curriculum can help you give wings to your students' dreams about aviation careers. And Thomas is here to help me do that. Thanks, Eric. My interest in aviation began when I was just a kid, and I, my flight training began when I was a senior in high school. So we probably shared a lot of the same passions in terms of a career in the aviation industry. I earned my private pilot's license when I was a freshman in college, followed by my instrument rating. By trade, I'm a health and physical education teacher, and I also serve in the Pennsylvania Air National Guard. 
So Eric, we both clearly wanted to be in the aviation industry from a young age, but is now a good time for our teachers to encourage their students to pursue their passion in aviation? Yes, absolutely. During the panel discussions, we heard a lot of enthusiasm for the future of aviation. Now remember that becoming a pilot doesn't happen overnight. So now is the perfect time for students to begin following their aviation dreams. And they can do that with you and our curriculum. So what exactly is the AOPA High School Aviation STEM curriculum? Well, for one thing, it's flexible. Schools use the curriculum as anything from an aviation elective to a full four-year career and technical education program. And schools can offer the curriculum as a pilot pathway, a drone pathway, or both. And speaking of flexibility, Eric, a number of our schools teach on a block schedule versus a traditional classroom schedule. So their class periods might be 60, 70, maybe even 90 minutes long. And schools in this situation, they can teach a year-long course in just one semester, and that allows them to move through the curriculum much faster. Also, schools don't have to implement the courses in order. For example, they can implement the second course before the first, but whatever the needs of your school are, we can help you meet them. Those are really great comments, Thomas. And what do they learn about in all these courses? Well, they learn, of course, about airplanes. They learn about drones, the physics of flight, the business of aviation, the history of flight, and aviation careers. But where does the curriculum come from, and who is AOPA? Well, the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association is the largest general aviation organization in the world and has been around for over 80 years. We have hundreds of thousands of members in 75 countries. The curriculum is in use in more than 200 high schools across 38 states. More than 8,000 students are in classrooms using this free curriculum. Yes, free, thanks to generous donations from friends and members of AOPA. We've seen amazing growth in just a few short years of this curriculum. But at the beginning, a teacher might be wondering, Eric, do I have to be a pilot to teach this curriculum? No, not at all. This curriculum was written for teachers of every interest level by veteran teachers who are also pilots, flight instructors, and drone operators. As teachers ourselves, we know what you're looking for in a curriculum. And it's all here. Course descriptions, material lists, pacing guides, lesson plans, slide presentations, video links, student activities, projects, formative and summative assessments, rubrics, differentiation ideas, and access to AOPA's phenomenal resources, including us. That's exactly right, Eric. And while you could print out all the curriculum documents and hard copies, every single one of them is readily available online so that you can have quick and easy access to them. If you need to share any documents, lesson activities, or presentations with your students, they can quickly be downloaded to any learning management system that you might use. Now let's dive into one of the most important things you'll find in our LMS, the lesson plan. Our lesson plans are full of clear instructions, discussion questions, teaching tips, and plenty of notes so that you can deliver instruction the moment the bell rings. You'll notice that the lesson plans are in the 5e format that STEM teachers all know and love. But for those of you who haven't used it or aren't familiar with it, it's a way to engage students, get them motivated to learn, and help them build their skills, a classic constructivist way of learning. And everything your supervisor is expecting to see in your lesson plans is there too. Objectives, NGSS standards, Common Core standards, and of course, FAA certification standards. You know, Eric, I'm really glad that you mentioned that teachers are ready to teach from the moment the bell rings. I always think back to a story that we heard from one of our curriculum teachers. Uh, her husband is also a teacher in the same school. While he is busy over the weekend writing lesson plans, gathering materials for class on Monday, she's content knowing that Monday morning she can walk into the classroom, fire up the AOPA curriculum, and go. So there's a lot of material and a lot of support that we offer, but let's talk about some of the amazing things that students will learn in each course. The first year of the curriculum is where students' interest in aviation and aerospace takes off, Thomas. They kick off the course by honing their engineering and design skills as they design, build, and test fly a heavy lift rocket. They also build a wind tunnel. They test their own airfoil designs. They learn about the history of aviation as well as the future of aerospace. How do you keep a marshmallow peep alive on Mars? Well, students get to engineer, build, and test a safe habitat for a sweet little astronaut. 
Career exploration is another hallmark of the introductory course, and students jump into the role of an NTSB investigator as they examine clues to determine the cause of an accident. We've seen a ton of photos and videos from our teachers sharing with us some of the wind tunnels, the hot air balloons, and some spectacular Martian habitats for their peeps. These activities really get the students excited about what comes next. And that would be the second year of our curriculum, where you start to turn your students into pilots. They begin learning the math and science behind everything they need to know to pass the FAA's pilot examinations. The students learn about the physics of flight and aerodynamics by flying model aircraft and simulators if your school has them. They learn about aircraft systems, flight controls, and the responsibilities of the pilot in command. How do students learn about hydraulic systems that move landing gear and control surfaces? Well, they build a model hydraulic system. How do they learn about aircraft electrical systems? They design and build working electrical circuits. Because the students are now preparing for the FAA pilot tests, FAA style questions are a part of every lesson, so they're familiar with the testing format and they can ace their exam. Let's dive into the third year of the curriculum now. In semester one, we take a look at a number of topics, including pre-flight procedures, airport operations, radio communications, and weather. And weather is one of the most important topics for pilots of any aircraft, whether it's a small drone or a passenger jet. And the first part of the third year is devoted to an extensive study of weather. But students also learn uh, so much about airport operations. Building a realistic airport model is one of the fun ways that students learn about runway markings and airport signs. And we can't forget about communications, can we, Tom? Roger that, Eric. Communicating with air traffic controllers and other pilots is something that both pilot and UAS students will study and practice in the first semester. And knowing where they are and what's around them is important to the safety of any flight, no matter how small. So pilot and UAS candidates study the aeronautical charts or maps that all pilots use, whether they're planning a flight or navigating in the air. You mentioned UAS students, Eric, and we've now reached the second semester of the third year. So let's hear from Michael Hangardner, our Senior Manager of Curriculum Development, about the UAS pathway. That's right, Thomas. In the second semester of the third year, schools are going to have a choice. They can choose between one of two pathways for their students, either a manned pilot track or a UAS track. UAS stands for Unmanned Aircraft Systems, or drones as we usually call them. Drones are at the leading edge of aviation technology. Their popularity has been exploding in recent years, and they're used in a wide variety of industries, everything from filmmaking to agriculture, from real estate to search and rescue. Drones are even used in underground mining operations, meaning that for the remote pilots of tomorrow, not even the sky will be the limit. So you might be wondering, what does someone need to do in order to become a commercial drone pilot? Well, currently, all you have to do is pass a single FAA written examination. And our curriculum is going to prepare your students to be able to do just that. Think of it, by the end of 11th grade, they could have a certification in their hand that would allow them to go to work as a professional drone pilot. That being said, our curriculum should not be thought of simply as a test prep course. We go far beyond the FAA standards, giving your students real world experience in a drone crew, allowing them to adopt different roles such as the pilot in command or the visual observer. We give your students hands-on experience at flying a classroom drone and also at planning missions and solving any problems that might arise in the field. By teaching students our curriculum, you will be enabling them to become knowledgeable, safe, and courteous drone pilots, which is exactly what the employers of today are looking for. As they enter the job market, they'll be uniquely positioned to rise above the rest. Thanks, Michael. Now for students following the pilot pathway, second semester is all about getting ready to take flight. Where are we going? Will there be enough fuel on board for the flight? Are the runways long enough for takeoff and landing? Learning about and calculating aircraft performance is an important part of this semester. At the end of this semester, students are prepared to take the FAA Private Pilot Knowledge Test. A passing grade on this test is good for two years, and it's an important stackable credential. What a year that is for the students. They learn about and engage in so many incredible aviation topics, and as you said, Eric, 
students are prepared for those FAA knowledge tests. Now, for the moment you've been waiting for. Over the past three years, teachers have been rolling out our curriculum to eager students across the nation. It's time to reveal what's in store for students in the fourth year of their journey to the career of their dreams. In year four of the pilot pathway, students launch into advanced aviation topics like instrument and commercial flying. But then students investigate the innumerable job opportunities in the aviation industry, both flying and non-flying careers. They learn about entrepreneurship as they contemplate starting their own aviation-related businesses. And they dive into rigorous research practices as they prepare for their final semester. Now, each of the first three and a half years are building blocks in your student's high school aviation experience. How will they pull together everything they've learned, explore their aviation interests, and gain valuable workforce experience? with the final semester's capstone project. This is where students may find themselves at an internship or an apprenticeship. They may start a drone business or earn a new FAA certificate. Mechanically inclined students might build an aircraft while creative students explore drone cinematography. The choice is theirs as they climb toward their aviation goals. Well, Eric, I know so many of our teachers were excited to get that sneak peek into the final year of the curriculum. And we have something else that's very exciting to share. The application window is now open for schools to teach the curriculum in the 2021-2022 school year. Look for a link to the application in the chat window. It's quick, it's easy, and it's not competitive. If you meet the requirements, you can teach the curriculum. And we're so excited to see your application soon. Throughout today's program, we've heard from teachers who love the curriculum, and we certainly love it as well. But at the end of the day, it's all for the students. And what do they think about the curriculum? Let's let Alexis Martin tell us about her experience. I think uh, flying is very enjoyable and it's freedom. To me, that's how I feel when I'm up in the sky. Hi, I'm Alexis Martin. I'm a junior at Steenville High School and I'm in aerospace engineering and aviation program. When I was young, I didn't think I was going to be a pilot at all. Everyone always asked me, like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I was like, mm, I don't know. Like, I had no idea what I wanted to be when I grew up. In seventh grade, Miss Campana um, had this class after school and I was like, oh, I'm going to try it out because I like to try stuff like that's different and new. And I stuck with it. And I I'm grateful that I did. We went as a class and that was my first time being like around an airplane in an airport. I never flew before an actual plane. And I just knew that that's what I wanted to be when I grew up, was a pilot because I just thought it was so interesting and I just felt so free when I was around it. I put my, uh, my academics first before anything because I, you need academics before you do anything else. My mom was a huge influence on me. I'm so grateful. She just told me to stick with it. In the 10th grade, we made a um, flying air balloon and it was uh, very cool. We had to really make it from scratch. Miss Campino was like, you have to do it. And it was just so fun because we had to figure out on our own. And I just like that about this class. We have to find out ourselves and then she'll help us. Miss C is family. She really blessed my life. Oh, tear up. She's a good woman. I really don't know where I would be if God didn't put her in my life. She's a true blessing. There would be um, no way that I would be able to go throughout this uh, journey um, without her. I've seen some kids that are like, you're a pilot. And I'm like, Yes, like I want to be a pilot and they're like, I didn't know females could do that. And that really sad because some kids don't think that, like some females don't think that they could be in this um, field just because males are in this field. And I've been talking to them I'm like, yes, females can be in this field. The AOPA curriculum has motivated me and driven me to be a private pilot. Um, if I wasn't introduced to AOPA, I don't know how I would study for the knowledge test. Um, practice fl uh, weather in VFR 
if that wasn't introduced to me, I wouldn't be able to be flying right now. Okay, Alexis is seriously impressive. She discovered something that she loves and set herself on a path to live out her dreams. That's what this symposium is all about, right? I have no doubt at all that she'll be a professional pilot in just a few years and maybe even flying with me. Alexis and the thousands of other students who are learning to fly are, are not only discovering the incredible STEM careers that are available to them, but they're also discovering how much they can achieve. And that's the reason all of us here at AOPA are so excited about what we do. And it's why we're so impressed by the teachers like Natalia Campagna and hundreds of others who are making such a difference in their lives. I do want to thank all of the educators who have joined us today for being here, but more importantly, for all that you do to help your students soar. I also want to take a moment to thank our sponsors, the U.S. Air Force, California Aeronautical University, Redbird Flight Simulations, and ASA. Click on any of the sponsor logos on this page for more information about how they can help you help your students. And be sure to check back with us in the next few weeks to get a truly exceptional discount on ASA Prepware to help your students get ready for the FAA knowledge tests. The last 90 minutes has been packed with so many great speakers and ideas that you can use to get your career kickstarted. I wish that I had had resources like these when I was first considering becoming an airline pilot. Imagine what we could do if we had two full days. We'd have keynotes from industry leaders, dozens of breakouts, insider tours, hands-on sessions, and time to network. And that's exactly what we've got planned for next year. Go ahead and mark your calendars for November 14 through 16, 2021. That's when we'll see you in Orlando for our next AOPA High School Aviation STEM Symposium. But you don't have to wait to start building your aviation program. Curriculum applications are open today. Just visit us at aopa.org apply to get started. Sadly, we're out of time for today. So on behalf of our terrific host, Swain Martin, and everyone here at AOPA, thank you. We can't wait to meet again.